Welcome to the MMHP in the 989. Channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history from the city by the bay. And now, here's your host, Scott Baker. We want to welcome you back for part two here with Dennis Lauren. We have to thank Dennis for returning here in September, September 17th for uh, round two with two more hours uh, catching up all his memories and backstory. Um, for those of you that got to hear episode one, as you could tell at the very end, we uh, end up getting in the middle of a massive rain and hailstorm uh, May 14th. So we had to cut that show short and he uh, took off for home back in Detroit. But uh, here we are with round two. Uh, this is where we pick up where we left off. We're trying to keep it cohesive and uh, we'll have part three next week. Thank you all for tuning in and thank you, Dennis, for making this trek and sharing your stories with the MMHP and the 989. See, we're back here at Studio 163 uh, in Essexville. We we are doing part two of the Dennis Lauren podcast. We had the craziest May 14th. And if you heard the end of episode one, you'll know exactly what we're talking about yeah. because <laughs> we had great stories and uh, history going right up through the, uh, what sounded like drumming going on in the background of all of our speech and talk. And uh, I, I wanted to pick up kind of in a spot, Dennis, you were... We ended up talking about Clover, Huey Lewis, recording the uh, Elvis Costello thing at the end there. Mm -hmm. However, I didn't think there was a strong transition on how you made it back out to San Francisco from Michigan to talk about the other Fillmore, because you were discussing how one Fillmore turned into the other, and one goes, hey, I played here before, and he oh, goes, oh, is that the same Fillmore? I'll clear I'll clear this up, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, 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 in the spring of uh, 1967... I came back from overseas where I was stationed in Turkey, which I may have mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I was sent to finish my hitch to uh, the Presidio of San Francisco. Yep. And so right away, uh, I, I was, I, I, in September I got my discharge, but I was already going to, it, music was like religion for me. I I would go to the Matrix on Thursday and the Fillmore on Friday and the Avalon on mm -hmm. Saturday. And you became a postman. We got that story. That's, yeah. yeah, that's true. But then you yeah. got came back to Mid Michigan or to Detroit area via postman, right? Yes, for a little while, and then I got a job at ad agency. Okay, and that's how you made your trip back out there. Well, no, uh, I I was there from '67 to '70. And then I came back to Michigan, and then when Cream moved the staff to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. I, I, wor I worked down there for about 15 years. And then in 2000, Gary Grimshaw asked me to come and work with him. So and by that time, he was living in the Bay Area. So I moved back up, and we had a, uh, two little businesses. One we called Artist Workshop West, and... Uh, in honor of the Artist Workshop in Detroit. And uh, and we had a little store briefly called Paper Song. And Oakland is really a working class town. And where we were located, if we'd have had the store in San Francisco, it probably would have been more successful. But um, we sold more incense <laughs> than, than anything else, right. you know. So... Uh, I, I, I was living in San Francisco area twice. Okay, that's kind of what I gathered, and we were hip-hopping around that idea when we left last yeah. left off four months ago. And, but I wanted, we, we were, I guess the spot we left off on your timeline was you were in a band, you played some shows at the Ark here, and somehow we worked our way back to San Francisco in our talk. Yeah. And I wanted to pick up where uh, you left off here well, in the 70s uh, I, during I, the Clover period. I, I, was, I was playing in bands before I was in the Army. And then when I came back uh, to D Detroit area in, in the 70s, I decided to just do a singer-songwriter thing. Mm -hmm. So I played at places like The Ark, and uh, there were there were dozens of, 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 uh, of places to play, like the Hush Puppy in Gross Point and uh, uh, the Crystal Wind on Joy Road in Detroit. And I'm not sure... You know, whatever happened to all those places, but I think the Ark still exists. So. Yeah, yeah. There was another place called Union Station, I think it was in Ipsy or Ann Arbor. Yeah. And um but I, I just I just did that because I was I was still interested in music, but when I started working at the at the ad agency, I I was still playing music 
uh, solo in, until about 1980. And then I went to, I was working at, at uh, Goldmine Magazine by that time, and it got to be just too much because right. I, <laughs> I don't know if you remember Goldmine when it was, yeah. at its height but it was like 280 pages yeah you know? and, and you you reminded us that you were trying to do the middle so you could pull it out yeah yeah, yeah because yeah. it was it was so ugly it was auctions you know <laughs> brian's sister would you know tape nine eight and a half by eleven pages that were typewritten on a, on a big board and she would do the the middle uh, well with the the ad section and i just thought since the auctions were you know, obsolete after a month, you should just pull it out right. because the stories were definitely savable. You know, but we were we were Rolling Stone size too, um, a tabloid, and uh, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. I shot all the half tones. I I laid out every story. You know. Yeah. Um, and you talked about how you went into different magazines like Thrasher or Thrash and different metal magazines. Yeah, and stuff. That, well, those were all spinoffs of Cream. And then you had something that Fred had a complete collection of. What was that? Goldmine. Was no, not Goldmine. RPM. It was RPM. Oh yeah. yeah, RPM. Yeah, RPM yeah. was in between Goldmine and uh, and um, um, and Cream. What happened was uh, is that I was. Um, Working for for Goldmine, and then they were sold to a company called Krause in in Wisconsin, and the only person em, employee they took was the advertising director, and because he knew all the people that were advertising, you know, mm -hmm. and so they had their own, own own presses, they had their own everything, so they didn't really need the rest of us. And uh, although the editor Jeff Tamarkin was there for a while. But it's ironic because I was actually Brian Buchanan's first employee that wasn't a relative. Mm. And I brought John on to so that he could um, generate ads. And then I brought uh, Jeff on after Rick Weitzel had passed away. Rick was the original uh, editor and uh, he died very young. And he was a, um, a kind of a remarkable person because he was a... Uh, uh, a paraplegic wow. and he was the only writer I've ever seen of any note that got a, an obituary in Rolling Stone magazine so that's how well regarded he was but um, you know he was one of those people that had to be turned over in the night and stuff like that and he had a rough life mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, that's I'm assuming why he he died so young. But mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> he 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 he'd, when you'd talk to him, he didn't you know, he didn't exude any pity for himself. You know he was he was he was his own normal. You know. Mm -hmm. right. Well, coming into the '80s here uh, with all that. You started doing album covers too. Was that where we what we were just trying oh, to get hit, sure. almost sitting on there? Yeah. Yeah. I well, what happened after I after I after Green uh, Goldmine was sold, I went to work for uh, Westbound Records, primarily doing uh, record covers. But um, Armin, the president of uh, of uh, of Westbound, said, you know. Goldmine was so successful, and I was already doing covers for him freelance, and he would come over and he said, he wondered if I could create something that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goldmine. Mm -hmm. And so he basically bankrolled uh, um, RPM, but it was very difficult to try to go up against a magazine that was published twice a month, you know, mm -hmm. and edit and lay it out and do everything. Yeah, basically. Okay. So after 12 issues, I said, you know, I don't want to see you waste any more money. So Grimshaw had called me and I had, I had, uh, they had an opening at Cream. And so I transitioned over there, but I still did covers for Armin. And I just wasn't there weekly, <laughs> you know, daily. <laughs> right. 
<clears throat> Dennis, you, you mentioned Westbound Records. Yeah. Uh, was Robert Zalagi, I, I'm not sure if I pronounced his name right, was he involved in that? Or did, say, try to say the last name again. Uh, Zalagi. Uh, I, I, I only... Re uh, how about, uh, did you do anything for the Flaming Embers or Flaming Ember? That no. was one of the groups. Okay, maybe it was... No. Uh, oh, I know of him now. I know who you mean. But I, I didn't really get to know him well. Okay. And, uh, you know, maybe just one of those introductions. And Right. I, his son contacted me and uh, said his dad was really involved in the music scene in Detroit. Yes. He mentioned the Flaming Ember. Of course, mm -hmm. we're pretty successful in their own right. Yeah. You know? um, so, okay, I just wondered if you had touched base with him at all. No. Uh, I, it's funny. I know a lot of people, but not everybody. <laughs> yeah. And you were you were in San Francisco, kind of during the uh, the golden age of Detroit rock, you know, yeah. where it kind of transitioned out of the teen clubs into right. groups like uh, the Rationals and SRC and the MC Five and yep. the Frost signing with major labels. Right. Were you aware of those bands back in San Francisco? Oh, sure. I I I actually would come back for holidays and and. Uh, and and go to the grandy with my brother you know so i it's not that i missed out on it completely plus you know bands like frost did play at the fillmore right mm -hmm. and mc5 played the fillmore did when, you did you happen to see them by any chance yeah i i took pictures of the mc5 and how were they uh, um and what's the word i want to say were were they uh accepted uh, did the the people on the West Coast like that hard-edged Michigan rock and roll. I I think I think there were people that did. Of course, everybody, uh, you know, from Berkeley was probably a little bit more political, and, and a lot of people, you know, like Country Joe and the Fish were from Berkeley, but they were considered part of the San Francisco, just across the bay. Right. So, um, you know, I think that there were. It's people that were much more, you know, because of the Vietnam War mainly, you know. Right. And, and uh, um, so politically, I don't think there would anybody in, in the Bay Area that would have batted an eye. But they were a little bit more aggressive than than some bands. But when you think about Janis Joplin singing or... Um, Blue Cheer, or right. you know. or even Big Brother. I mean, yeah. that was a pretty oh, heavy-duty yeah. rock band. Yeah, Jim Gurley was from Michigan, and he played scorching lead guitar in Big Brother. You know, in fact, I think I think uh, the people that tried to talk Janice away from Big Brother were sadly mistaken. Oh, they, for sure. I think they were a much better band than people give them credit for i know that people used to put them down yeah. and it was like janice joplin was all about go. janice yeah. yeah and but her recordings i'm trying to think of the uh uh what was the band she went to at first um full tilt full tilt well that was no the, no no that was full the last tilt was band, the last oh, band. Yeah. um she after big brother they formed a group around her called the cosmic blues band. cosmic right. blues band yeah. there you go yeah and they they just didn't fit as well as right. uh you know big brother and the holding company well did basically they were all back, <coughs> back, backup bands but if you if you listen to the first big brother and the holding company album they all sang mm -hmm. they all did individual songs yeah. they all wrote it wasn't just Janice. Yeah, it was you, a true band. Yeah, and you hear her doing backups to Sam Andrews and other members of the band. So, although, you know, after Monterey, she pretty much became the focus. Right. And stood out a little bit more than, say, the early days. Probably if you had seen them in 66... It would have been much more diverse and homogenized than than it became. Right. You know, after after Monterey, that's when. I mean, right from the get go, I think I think. Uh, what was her manager's name? The same guy who did Paul Butterfield and Bob Dylan and Albert Grossman. Albert Grossman. Grossman. Yeah, I think he was actually the one. They weren't going to let themselves be filmed. They had a different manager named Julius Carpen, and he 
he was one of those San Francisco music people that didn't like all the people from L.A. Right. You know, that was a, <laughs> that was selling out was L.A. And he he didn't want them filmed, but everybody was so impressed at their set. Um, they brought him back. They right? brought him back for yeah. that. And Albert Albert Grossman coerced this other guy to uh, Julius Carpin to let them be filmed. Oh, of course, and then when they filmed, it was really only jazz. <laughs> they didn't really show the yeah. the other ba band members. You very see much, them a little you know? bit, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It it it. It probably was a little unfair, but uh, she knocked everybody out. Oh, that's certainly. I mean. That's a classic performance. So. <laughs> well, you you got to know the MC5 yeah. after you returned yeah. to Detroit, but at that time, things were kind of going downhill for the band a little bit anyway. Yeah, um, Can you kind of expand on those days and, and what was happening with the MC5? Yeah, I, uh, there were several of us that, that shared a house down by Wayne State, and... Uh, uh, a guy named Rick Jushis was one of the roommates, and he uh, he was the road manager for them. And so he drove the truck of, with the equipment, and he did the laundry for the stage clothes and stuff like that. So occasionally, the members of the MC5 would come over and dump their laundry. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and the guy I saw the most was Wayne Kramer. And... My son was about five years old then, and he, in the living room he had an electric train, and Wayne would get down there and play electric trains with him. So I have a picture of the MC5 that's slightly different than, <laughs> than other people, because, you know, you saw him in a more domestic situation. But uh, Yeah, Wayne kind of, have you read his book? No, I haven't. He kind of really gets into, you know, kind of fell into... The drug. Uh, the drug scene yeah. and kind of a life of crime. And, yeah. Uh, so, did you know Wayne during the, that time in his life? Well, probably, but he, it, 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 sometimes it wasn't apparent. Oh, you know okay. what I mean? People, people could be involved in something and not let other people notice it or see it. You know? Right. Didn't he go to prison? Oh, yeah, yes. he did. Yeah, he was selling cocaine. And that's uh, he's got a. An organization now called Jail Guitar Doors that yeah. you know is is trying to help rehabilitate people in yeah. prison through music. So uh, yeah. yeah, he's done some some good things afterward. It's funny though it, uh, when I was living in Los Angeles, I guess after he got out of prison, he briefly lived around Nashville somewhere. But he eventually came out to L.A. looking for a record deal, and although I didn't do any album covers for him I may have been responsible for him getting signed to the label that eventually put out two or three of his solo albums oh, okay yeah um, I'm trying to remember now it was a it was one of those uh, strong indies because anti of, huh anti was the anti no not anti it was <clears throat> it was prior to that uh, it was uh it would 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 have been one of those really hardcore Roadrunner. No, seems I I remember those first four. I, I, I got yeah. them in I got them in the nineties. Uh, I think the label started with an E. Epitaph. That's it. They became anti. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they did become anti. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All these labels eventually merge. You know. Mm. <laughs> now there's only like three major labels. <laughs> mm. Yep. That own just about all the music in the world. <laughs> yep. That was uh, the. Uh, Bad, bad religions label, music yeah, label. That's right. That's right. Did you uh, get to know Fred Smith at all? No, I met him a few times, but uh, he's a very quiet guy. Yeah. So you did you ever see Sonic's Rendezvous band? Oh play? yeah, many times. Yeah, that was kind of a super group that seems like it should have been more successful. Well, than it and was. I, I don't know why it was, except that that uh, uh, he wasn't very aggressive. And even, you know, after he married Patti Smith, they should have been signed to somebody. Mm -hmm. I was over there to do a picture sleeve, and Freddie Brooks was their manager. And I remember sitting at the kitchen table, and I already had done a couple of different comps, and one I thought were really was really nice. And for, uh, he kept 
he kept nodding out. Ooh. So I think he was he was like Wayne. I think he was on drugs too, only harder. I mean, I think he was doing heroin. Okay. And Patty was somewhere in the house, but I never saw her. And all I remember is like Fred would nod off, and then he'd wake up, and then he'd go, "Oh, why don't we take a picture of a little girl standing on the corner?" Then he'd not off again, you know. <laughs> it wasn't the most creative. And ultimately, when the record came out, they put the same song on both sides, and Patty just took a, a magic marker and said Sonic's Rendezvous. It wasn't even Grimshaw's really nice logo that mm -hmm. he had done for them. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, to have Fred and uh, was Scott. Scott Morgan, for goodness sake. Scott sakes. Morgan, Gary, yeah. Riz music. And... Uh, they had one of the uh, Ashton Mason brothers on Ash drum. Yeah, no, it Gary was Gary Rasmussen on it, bass. It, it, it was it was uh, it was the MC Five, the Stooges, the Up, the Rationals. and the Rationals <laughs> supergroup. Yeah, <laughs> you know? absolutely. I, on paper, it should it should have it should have worked. And those live shows are that you hear now. They're, oh, they're just fantastic. Yeah. yeah, really. There's some mm. live recordings that are really good. Yeah, yeah, just... There's a there's a company called Easy Action that seems to have access to a lot and puts out a lot of CDs on that one. Uh, did you do any work with Leo Spear? Uh, he he owned, ran the Michigan Palace at all. Did you do any poster work for him? Um, just I think just probably the uh, was a Michigan Palace of the, the New York Dolls Aerosmith one. Right. Oh, you, you did that poster? Yeah. Okay. That's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow, very good. Oh, <laughs> oh cool. Yeah. My, my cousin went uh, on a trip to Cleveland, and she came back and, and took the... And she, she was just looking at the posters, and they all had little cards saying, you know, what they were and who did them. And she saw my name, and she took a picture and oh. put it on Facebook. So now everybody knows. So. That's cool. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. Now you got involved in kind of the the punk scene in in Detroit too. I know you did the uh, the the picture sleeve for uh, Joe Kidd's band, The White Lines. Yes. And uh, did you do anything with the uh, Romantics, who were kind of breaking out at that time too? Well, this is a really funny thing. At the time, they they uh, had Archer press their, their first single on Spider, but they did it all on their own. And they, uh, I was just talking, talk, talking to Wally and, and their manager, Arnie, because Wally's doing a new single, which I'll mention. And uh, they pressed that at Archer Records, which are a pressing plant in Detroit. And... Mm -hmm had Michigan Paper and Dye do the sleeve. Now, these were all companies that uh, I used in some cases, too. But when I was approached by several bands to make picture sleeves that looked more like they did from England, they were a little stiffer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had devised a little bit heavier. And if you, you grab it there, the Denizen single is the latest one I've done. Uh, oh. This was a band that played at uh, at Bookies back in the day, and uh, okay, I uh, I just did this for them, and the records were actually pressed at Archer, so <laughs> it, cool. it was printed in ro Rocket Printing in Royal Oak, and it was fabricated by Michigan Paper and Dye, and pressed by Archer, so it's a real local product. Now, is that an original recording, Dennis, or is that something a new recording well, that they just did? Recordings. Okay. Yeah. They, they, uh, the guy who works at Third Man Record, Dave Buick, did a Denizen single several years ago, and then that band decided to do another one. Still not my favorite song. There was a they did a song called Danger in Disneyland, which I thought had hit potential. <laughs> I love the title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I started uh, to answer your question. I I was approached. Um. I did the second single on Spider Records, which is the Romantics label for the reruns. And I did the um, Mutants, Destroy All Monsters, and Flirt were the first handful. And they all sort of approached me simultaneously. And I ultimately, all the while I was working at, at Goldmine and 
and uh, Westbound and Cream. I was doing picture sleeves for punk, punk bands. I've done hundreds of them. They're what, all pretty what? collectible right now. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I I used to have them all at my store. I don't I, know if you brought them or I'd probably somebody Bob, brought Bob them. Tremaine. Bob okay. Tremaine. He, he distributed a lot of the singles. Bob did. Anyway, but yeah, I was at a poster show in San Francisco in the 90s. And there was a guy came up, and we all had name tags. And he said, are you Dennis Lauren? I said, yeah. And he, he said, the Dennis Lauren? I said, I, I guess so, you know. <laughs> and he says, I'm from Italy, and I have all, I, I have, a, a, you know, a lot of 45s from Detroit, and your name's on all of them. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That's how far reaching it got. That's yeah, so cool. That's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the real interesting characters from that period, I thought, was Niagara. Yeah, the lead singer of uh, Destroy All Monsters, who it's now turned out to be a pretty good artist. Prolific, I've, yeah. I've got one of her prints uh, in our apartment in New Jersey. Oh. <laughs> uh, what what uh, what can you tell us about Niagara? She's kind of a mysterious, well, person. She she's probably a better artist than she was a singer, <laughs> but I think that didn't matter when with Destroy All Monsters, they which was another. One of those bands like Sonic's Rendezvous, they had, they had uh, the bass player was from the MC5, Ron Ashton from the Stooges, yeah, and they had a couple of other uh, players in there. Was that Michael Davis? Michael Did Davis. He, he yeah. played bass for yeah. them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and and Niagara was sort of the Iggy, uh, you know, uh, uh, filled the Iggy slot. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But a very she, attractive Iggy. But though. she, yeah, 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 she looked way better than Iggy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I can't really, you know, uh, uh, I think, I think I, 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 she was there for more than her singing. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. I think. But uh, she would hand me the drawings, and then I would put the picture sleeve together and take the pictures and put them on the back. So. Sometimes it'll, it'll, she'll sign, you know, the front and, and on the back it'll say a uh, graphic assistance by Dennis Lauren or something oh, nice. like that. Oh, nice. Right. You know? Very cool. <laughs> Anyways, I went to one of her art shows in, uh, uh, in San Francisco the last time I saw her, and she was promoting a new book of her paintings and things. And... Uh, I saw her come in. We, I was there with my friend, and, and uh, uh, she came in the door and she she spotted me right away, you know. And so Kent took a picture. She's got her arm around me and stuff like it's cute. So. Oh, nice! <laughs> yeah. I, and then you kind of transitioned into the. I, I don't want to call it the newer, punk movement. When you get into the eighties, and this is you know it's again in Detroit. Uh, with the with Jack White and you oh, know, that was well, actually that was the early two thousands. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that yeah, okay. there's a big gap there. Here's what happened. I I kept reading, and you know, you talk about uh, Rolling Stone and Cream and stuff like that. The best music magazines are being published in England right now. One called Mojo and. Mm -hmm. There's another yeah. one called Uncut. And, yeah, I'm familiar with both of them. They're yeah. really good I magazines. Like two of my yeah. favorites. Yeah, yeah. and uh, the best magazine in, in in America right now, I think, is one called Ugly Things, which is basically a, a about a that thick quarterly fanzine that that does all kinds of historical stuff. And I've written some historical stuff on Detroit bands in the past, and I'm going to do one on this new wave punk scene too is that what ugly things kind of caters to that the well that music that that type of music scene the punk uh, yeah probably probably indie anything scene. psychedelic 60s mm -hmm. um garage band what would be termed garage band music and um they don't really cover too much current they're mostly in in the reissue but i mean the record reviews take up about a third of the magazine, mm -hmm. and it's quite uh, impressive, you know. Well, I'll check that out. Yeah, yeah you can you can <clears throat> Google it online, and 
I don't know any store locally that carries it, but in the Bay Area, I used to just go to the record store and get it, you know. I, but I don't know how well their distribution is. Yeah, it's it's hard to find uh, any bookstores around here that okay. carry a lot of magazines. Can you guys think of any? Barnes & Noble. That's Barnes & Noble. 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 Saginaw. That's where yeah, I go. Yeah, in Saginaw, right. Yeah. I, I haven't seen ugly things there, though, have you? I don't no. think I have. I've seen a 60s uh, psychedelic magazine there, and I'm not sure what the name was, but okay. that's been there for a couple of years. Yeah, usually you could find maybe Mojo or Uncut at, at Barnes & Noble right. in Saginaw. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Prague, and they got another one, Classic Rock, and yeah. and the Classic Rock sometimes has a lot of uh, like reissued stories. Yeah, but it's it's a cool, yeah. well done. But the Prague one's cool if you're into progressive music. Oh, I I I am. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm so eclectic. It's not funny. You yeah. know? <laughs> I, I read I love, them all. <laughs> they 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 they'll, they'll still do current stories on current music, so it's nice. Yeah, I'm never sure when I'm going to get that email or phone call to do. You know, because it all comes just out of the blue for me. I don't, I don't advertise or solicit people. So you're waiting to do a prog rock album like, like Roger uh, Dean. Yeah, or... I've got one in in ready. In fact, I did a yes in Asia poster for the Warfield in San Francisco, and it's a seven color screen print. And I use Roger Dean's imagery as an inspiration. Now, is that the one we have in the museum? Yeah. Yeah, okay, say, I yeah, think we saw that at the museum. Yeah, there, yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I went to the concert with Chuck, and Chuck and I, it, Chuck was was one of the partners in, in uh, um, what did they call it? The Firehouse Rock Art Company. But by this time, they were printing in a, in, in, in a print, their own print shop in uh, Oakland, California, that they called Hangar 18. <laughs> and so I came in at six six o'clock in the morning and and uh and to work on printing the poster with Chuck and uh, his partner came in around noon, you know, but we were really mad because we were far into it, and his partner had uh used up all the paper without knowing and uh, so that's a very limited edition of about a hundred and sixty prints but it's probably my favorite poster i've ever done and uh while we were at the concert chuck and i went to the concert because they always gave the artists and the printing guys um uh free tickets to the show and so um i was at the show and 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 in, in between sets uh somebody came out and got chuck and i to he, they said, Roger Dean wants to meet you. And so there I was uh, uh, backstage uh, again. And uh, um, I introduced, introduced myself and, and I said, did you like it? And he says, it's so good you should be shot. You know? <laughs> And then it, and I think Chuck still had like ink on his hands, you know. Uh, <laughs> But he, he he asked us both to come out. The next day he was having a gallery show, and we hung out with him all day. Wow. And Very just talked cool. about art and stuff like that. And Chuck, being the smart guy that he is, has got the only copy of that poster signed by Dennis Lauren and Roger Dean. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Awesome. All right. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Those are probably the ones that went growing up, uh, uh, you know, my friend... Gary Asel, who's been on these shows, who's like my other dad, he, he had all the Yes albums, so it was like, oh, okay. so we'd just stare at them for hours, and, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. and then the Hypnosis uh, crew, when they came in and took over and did some uh, other different things. And, both both of the, uh, both Roger Dean and Hypnosis were heroes of mine, too. Yeah. I, I, you know, you're always up against what the artists themselves want. You mm -hmm. know, every once in a while you'll get a band that'll say, do what, it, do something, you know, do something great, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> But um, I, I did I did a design I'm still trying to sell for a band called a uh, power trio called Krugerrand who ended up I thought they would love it because I had a flying eyeball screaming at you and all the space stuff going on and uh, they ended up just wanting a their picture on the cover 
Oh, okay. They're walking down the hallway of the Fisher Building in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this killer design. You're just waiting for the right band to come along and yeah. <laughs> accept this. Well, okay, if any and bands are out there listening, uh, <laughs> you may have a ready-made classic. <laughs> I got well, You know, you, uh, you also uh, worked with probably, I guess, the most famous recent musician coming out of Detroit, Jack White. And the White Stripes, I well, mean, well, boy, well, they kicked off uh, well, real interest in Detroit rock and roll. Here's what happened. I, again, reading all these magazines, I I was aware that there was this band in Detroit, and there were several bands. There was a whole new scene. Right. There was the Dirt Bombs and the uh, uh, Detroit Cobras and uh, the White Stripes and several more, and... They were all, all beginning to, you know, put out CDs and uh, uh, and and start touring. And I happened to be up in this is about two thousand one, I believe. My friend Tom Fletcher, who was another guy who used to work for the Metro Times, but came out to L.A. in in the in the nineties <coughs> sometime. He had le he had leukemia, and he asked me to be his caregiver when he had his bone marrow transplant. And being freelance, I I could do my work from anywhere. Really, that's when I first discovered I could. <laughs> and uh, I, I I I took care of Tom for about three or four months, and we were in a, like an adult Ronald McDonald house for adults right near the Seattle Cancer Center, and. Uh, but, you know, I had a lot of free time, and I noticed in, in the local entertainment paper that the White Stripes were coming to a place called the Crocodile Cafe. So I went down, to, I found the place somewhere during the day, and uh, I wasn't sure what it was because it was called the Crocodile Cafe. I thought it might be a restaurant or a restaurant bar or something like that. And I, I found it, and I went in, and I introduced myself and took some samples of my work, and I said, would it be all right if I did a poster for your White Stripe show? And they said, oh, yeah, we'd love it, you know. <laughs> so the night of the show, I went to, went to it, introduced myself to Jack and Meg, and at that point I asked, are there any more posters I could do for you? And he gave me a list and then he put me in touch with their booking agent because at that point he was managing himself themselves and I did I did about 16 of them and then I was at a poster show in Seattle and there was this guy that approached me from Austin Texas and he named Rob Jones and he said uh, I see you've done a lot of posters for the White Stripe and I said well I'm not the only ones but I said, send me your email and I'll give you the phone number. And I put him, put him in touch with the, with the management by the time, by that time they had real managers, especially when they started signing with major labels. Mm -hmm. you know? So I may have got kicked myself in the foot because he went, he went ever, all of us that were doing white stripes posters, and there may have been a half a dozen of us, uh, suddenly got boxed out because Rob Jones signed an exclusive contract to do a poster for every concert, uh -oh. which was going to kill him. You know, yeah. I, you know, you can't, that's, that's a deadly game too. In fact, I know the only other group of people I know that do a band's every concert on the tour, there are three of them. And they said, if it was just one of us, we couldn't do it. But the three of us can rotate, you know, Right. And have a little bit more space and time. And uh, that's Justin Hampton and uh, Emick and uh, another guy named... Uh, uh, his, his name escapes me at the moment. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, doing a whole tour, uh, especially if it's merchandise, if, if it's going to sit there and be sold to the, to the fans, you know... That's a, that's a real that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So 
I only had two or three more ideas, and when he he kind of, Rob Jones kind of boxed us out, you know. Now he tells people a different story, but <laughs> I was definitely the one that gave him the number. Well, how did you end up uh, doing posters like that classic Egyptian theme poster we have at the museum? Was that later or no? That was during the that sixteen run I did a run of 16 posters holy mackerel yeah how long did it take you to put that one together I mean that's so elaborate well before the yes in Asia poster there were there was a gallery owner in 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 uh, Berkeley named Dennis King and he said that was the best thing I ever done and then I said well should I just like die and stop and <laughs> And then, and then when I did the Yes in Asia, I took it back in, and he goes, uh, you know, <laughs> because, well, the Egyptian one, it was just, it was just a natural to, uh, you know, play around with the bronze colors. You know, if you mm -hmm. look at the Yes in Asia one, there's a lot of iridescent colors that are like translucent mm -hmm. because they're 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 printed underneath with silver. And then you put a more transparent color over the top; it it becomes kind of luminescent. Anyway, those 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 are a lot of work because they sometimes um, uh, involve you know seven or eight colors, and the the firehouse guys always love playing with metallics. Mm. They sort of cornered the market on that, and. Um, that's what made their stuff look so distinctive, or anything they printed. Right. But they were usually when I would do a screen print, I I uh, I, I would always go to them. They were they were my pals. Well, tell us a story about um, how you came up with the Egyptian theme, and what Jack and Meg's reaction was oh, to when yeah. they saw the poster. I, I actually classic. went. I went to one of their shows at the at the. Uh, um, Warfield uh, Music Theater in San Francisco, and it, it, this was just before the show, and I I went there purposely to get my picture taken with them. It was supposed to be in a book called The Art of Modern Rock, but they they didn't end up using the picture, but I still have it. But uh, um, most of the posters that they put in that book were White Stripes posters, and. I showed them the idea for the Egyptian one, and and Jack just laughed and said, "Meg, look at this." What I was doing was, they had told everybody that they were brother and sister, but they were actually ex husband and wife. Right. So I thought the Egyptian theme was a natural because the pharaohs married their sisters. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was ripping on. Right? Wow. And so when I showed it to Jack, he got it like right away. And I, you know, I, I, I would do things just like they did things. They'd all dress in like black and red and white, you know. And Jack, when in interviews, would say his favorite number was three. So I'd sometimes put a little three somewhere. <laughs> Jack White the third. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I, I, I just, uh, I thought thematically. Well, I'm hoping that when all is said and done, people will remember some of the images I created for them. Well, but it was perfect because I was doing all of this Egyptian theme stuff, and then I talked to their their uh, booking agent, and he says, "Well, they're playing the Horus Club in Rome." So I said, "This is perfect. I've got right. the Eye of Horus on on the poster, you know," and so. Um, it was some artwork I had done that was just looking for a home. Uh -huh. Sometimes when I when I work with certain bands, I'll I'll do the artwork before I ever get uh, a, a concert assignment. Mainly because I've done work with them before. I mm -hmm. I usually have stuff in my pocket ready, you know. <laughs> well, just in case, like Moon Alice, uh, I'm the go-to guy when when their manager pencils in. An extra extra gig on on a, on a tour, and uh, they called me last Friday to do one for the Red Dog Saloon in Virginia City, 
which was the place where the charlatans started right. way back when. Probably the first poster that would be considered a psychedelic poster was for the mm -hmm. Red Dog Saloon. <laughs> wow. So, Have you done that one yet, Dennis? I, I, I actually did the 50th anniversary of the charlatans at the Red Dog Saloon. Okay. Which was based on the original one that was done by Mike Ferguson, the piano player, and George Hunter, the uh, auto harp player. And they did this, you know, it was just in black and white, but it's so iconic that right. people call it the seed. And I guess it was printed in two editions, one with blue and one with just black ink. But I, I, I worked with George very closely on the 50th anniversary and we'd done a full color extravaganza but based on that artwork okay yeah. i redrew it all <laughs> now was that the last poster you did with the the white stripes then oh no this was for the charlatans no the, I'm, oh, I'm just oh. going back to the egyptian oh. uh, thing I'll, I'll have to check i may have done one after after that the next one I had in the can was sort of a Lancelot and Guinevere. I was going to do because he was always talking about chivalry, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I I would read these interviews and then I would read into it and read the lyrics. No, I did another one and it has it has the squirrels, which is another thing. There, I made a border of red leaves and squirrels. You don't see the squirrels right away because they're silhouette, and on that. On that album, during that period of time, they had a song called Dead Leaves on the Dirty Ground and another song called Be Like the Squirrel Girl. Uh, you know, he's okay. saying that he's telling the girl to be like the squirrel. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, yeah, I was always doing something that was relatable to the, to the band in some way and trying to keep as much as possible, you know, the, the, the red and black and white colors. There were posters with other colors in it, but those were the dominant colors. Right. Now, you mentioned a couple other Detroit bands. Uh, the Detroit Cobras, who I like quite a bit, but unfortunately their lead singer, yeah. Rachel Nagy, just passed away. Yes. Did you do any of their work on their... I think they put out two or three CDs, didn't they? I didn't do any of their CD covers, uh, but I, I, did, I did do quite a few posters. And I did quite a few posters for the Dirt Bombs. I... I didn't do any of their CD covers either, but sometimes that happens. People don't sometimes think. It's almost two separate worlds, the album covers and the concert posters. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you're dealing with different people. Like when Jack said, well, we're on the road all the time, so just get in touch with the road manager, or he'll call you, you know? Right. So, and... Uh, so, I, uh, you know, with with record sleeves, it's it, it's either the band or an art director or production manager at a record company, or in some cases, I know people who own their own labels, and like my friend Freddie in Austin, Texas, and he's uh, just been doing these. Uh, Rocky Eric, live Rocky Erickson, because he was the oh, drummer yeah. in the in the background or in the backup band called the Explosives. Well, they were their own band, and then they became Rocky's band. Right. Um, and uh, I just did a second edition of of one called Halloween. This is called Halloween Two, and I brought the, brought it. It's in the black bag, but I'll I'll show you guys later. Is it Which is it a CD? No, or a vinyl a, album. It, it's it's a vinyl, but we're now working on both Halloweens to be CDs. Okay. Is there much of a market for 45s anymore? Vinyl 45s? I think so. Yeah. I think people have become infatuated with, with vinyl again. But and I know I'm doing more. In fact, this, uh, you mentioned the, the romantics. Uh, Wally Palmer... Uh, is doing a new single with a guy from Canada named Jack DeKaiser. He's a blues guy. I heard of him. 
Yeah, he's well known in Canada, yeah. but he, I I hadn't heard of him here before. But he's 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 won awards in Canada, so he's he's up there. And uh, uh, it's a, it's about the Ukrainian war. And Wally is is uh, ethnically uh, Ukrainian. I guess I always thought he was Polish because he he grew up with all those bands in Hamtramck. You know, mm-hmm. the mutants, the reruns, and the romantics were like the Hamtramck <laughs> uh, triumvirate. Well, uh, Ukraine's pretty close to Poland, so. Well, yeah, I'm sure that maybe even linguistically it's yeah. similar. But I didn't. I didn't realize that his real name was Vladimir, and he somehow <laughs> well, got okay. Wally out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right, so. Vladimir. I don't hear that too often. Yeah. <laughs> I that could even be <laughs> Russian. <laughs> right. I got that first empty. Was it empty hearts? The album he put oh, out with the sure. supergroup. Yeah, the super from a few yeah. years ago. Yeah. And I heard that most of the second one. I haven't picked it up yet, but yeah. that was wonderful. Yeah, that was. Yeah, a good that's album. A, that's a nice album too. Yeah. So I haven't I haven't heard the single yet, but I'm I've already got the front cover. They've approved it, and I'm just waiting for all of the. Uh, I've done most of the back cover, but we're waiting for all the liner notes to trickle in. And I usually want the liner notes all at once so that I can copy fit things. Mm-hmm. But I told these guys, you know, don't send me any information until you got it all. And I mean a barcode and a record label, you know, a logo. <laughs> and uh, they didn't pay attention. They've been dripping and driving <laughs> it in. Is there any rumblings about this developing into an album? I'll ask. Okay. I don't know. It, I mean, it, it, you know, if if the single would take off, that's probably inevitable. Well, sure. Yeah, yeah I guess that's right. If, when that comes around, will you... Yeah. You post to us or somebody so we can put it on our podcast oh, sure. page so we can tag you and that sure. all in there. Yeah, I'd like to put that up on my yeah. Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Facebook page too. Yeah, yeah, yeah because uh, yeah, the the romantics. I I'd see them every time they'd come through through San Francisco. They were on a, a little Stephen tour, and I think they were on the bill with the with the Zombies, which was a great show. You know. Oh. This is the zombies when they were uh, uh, doing uh, the their, reunion. Yeah, the time of the season, the yeah. whole album. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I saw that in New York City. It was really good, but they didn't have the romantics opening. That would have yeah. that would have been a real nice yeah. bonus. Well, they, I, another another time there was another San Francisco band that I'd done work, work, a lot of work with was called Magic Christian. You know, named after that the film. Bad Finger mm-hmm. or the movie, right? Um, and. Uh, Lead guitar player and that that band is is Cyril Jordan from the Flame and Groovies, but he's a he's reformed the Groovies now, and I just did a, a forty five for them. Wow! Uh, I and, just uh, I put uh, my favorite album by them is Teenage Head. Yeah. Oh yeah. I just put that on my my phone. I've been listening to that lately. What a great album that is! Yeah. Yeah. Just straight ahead rock and roll. Yeah, they were they were one of the San Francisco bands that was. Uh, they didn't quite fit. You wouldn't call them psychedelic, you know, because they were just, they were, like you said, they were just a straight up rock and roll band. They, they, they didn't have any affectations or pretensions to, you know, being cosmic. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, they came around at the wrong time. Yeah. You know, everybody was listening to this, you know, Pink Floyd, progressive yeah. rock, yes, and so on. And they're just like, wow. They were like right out of 1966. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, they, 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 they're, they're good guys. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still in touch with Cyril quite often. And, uh, uh, Paul, who was the lead singer in Magic Christian, he's now the lead singer for The Seeds, which has a re- reunion. Really? Uh, Do they have any of the originals? I know Sky Saxon is no longer with us. but No, but uh, Paul does a pretty good replication of Sky, but he, uh, they have the keyboard player and I think the second drummer. There were There were two... There was an original drummer, and then he he lasted a couple albums, and they replaced him, you know, with another guy. 
So this is a guy. It's it's like the guitar player in in uh, Iron Butterfly. He's he replaced Eric Braun, who died. But when he when they when they were playing in De- in Detroit here not long ago, he goes. I've been with. I'm not the original guitar player, but I've been with the band for 35 years. <laughs> Eric Barnett. Oh, yes. <laughs> Eric's cool. <laughs> this is the Seeds. <laughs> Huh? It, it, this is the new version of the Seeds. Oh no! Well, I'm I'm saying that it's a very similar situation. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, uh, uh, it it's it's like it's like Brian Wilson. He has this band. Uh, their core group was called the Wonderments, but there are like nine musicians, and they all sing. Mm-hmm. He can he can even replicate the overdubs live. You know, right? That's cool. <laughs> yeah, I saw you know uh, when he did the whole Pet Sounds album at, I think it was still Pine Knob at yeah. that time. Well, again, it's Pine Knob, but uh, yeah, they were terrific uh, as backing that, band. That was another album I was fortunate to work on. Uh, talk about a small world. Um, my friend uh, Mark London came over one day and he said. Dennis Brian Wilson's playing at the Wiltern Theater, and he thought it would be a one-off concert. You know, he didn't know that they would put a whole band together and eventually go back on the road, because remember Brian left the Beach Boys because he didn't want to be on the road. Right, right. He just wanted to be in the studio and write songs and and record. Um, probably much for the same reason the Beatles stopped touring. So. Uh, Anyway, uh, I guess Brian had gone to a Nancy Sinatra show at Spaceland, another kind of interesting club, and he saw the Wonderments backing her up, and he goes, that's my band. So he he filched uh, Nancy Sinatra's backup band. Of course, they put out albums on their own under the name The Wonderments. Right. And sadly, uh, uh, Nick Walusko, or Nicky, they call him, he, he, he was the lead guitar player and he passed away here. And when I would help Mark, you know, working on, on graphics for the Smile album cover and Pet Sounds and all this other stuff they were mm-hmm. doing, tour books and all kinds of merchandise, T-shirts, uh, Nicky would come over and play, play. You know, he would just sit there and you'd ask him, uh, "We'll play this song," and he'd know it. You know, and he'd he'd sound just like George Harrison. You know, he mm. he was like a chameleon. A, a, yeah, a, yeah. He um, all those guys in 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 the Wonderments could could do the Beach Boys perfectly. I mean, you saw the concert, right? right? They were terrific. Terrific. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know if. If there's a better band out there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you get to meet Brian at all? Oh, yeah. I heard, actually heard the final mix to the smile, the, the Brian Wilson smile in 2003 in his mm-hmm. music room. Wow. In surround sound. <laughs> wow. He has his piano and all these speakers <clears throat> around and a couple of couches, you know. Is he is he a little bit more outgoing in that? kind of environment in his own place in his own studio than he seems to be outside he's very shy right first first off he's very shy plus he's had you know years of um mental health issues and and he's another one that probably took too much acid that like rocky erickson uh you know sid barrett skip spence from moby grape they all heard voices and sometimes, you know, voices telling them to kill themselves or something like, or kill somebody else, or all, I mean, these are, they think they're hearing them. But nowadays they have some medications that almost get them normal. And Rocky was able to come back and Brian was able to come back because of, of these uh, medicines. Mm-hmm. Peter Green briefly did too. Another one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know why it is some people could take acid and, and be all right and others would come back just 
beyond the pale. You know? Probably well, like the very powerful, like the current COVID thing going around. People yeah. can handle it; others can't. Yeah. Right? So, oh, on alcohol, on. there's everything. Oh, yeah. 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 And that'll wrap up part two with Dennis Lauren. We got a little backstory on Sonic Rendezvous Band, uh, how Dennis got back and forth from San Francisco, as well as uh, putting together Jack White's posters and the White Stripes connection, uh, leading into Smile here with Brian Wilson, which is exactly where we will pick up the uh, following Thursday on part three for this brand new year 2023 kickoff. And we want to thank you for tuning in, and thank you again, Dennis Lauren, for being part of the uh, MMHP and the 989. We will see you soon. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week, posted every weekend. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredrife.com, Brought to you by Michigan Rock and Roll Legends, located both inside the Bay County Historical Museum on Washington Avenue, as well as Scotty's Sandbar on Evergreen Drive at the Bay City Middle Grounds. On behalf of the hosts, Gary, Dr. J. Johnson, Sir Fred Reif, archivist and videographer Mike Beatty, and myself, this podcast wouldn't be here without Studio 163's Alan Garcia, the voice of MMHP, Mr. Eddie Switek, all of our guests, and you listeners you've been listening to the mmhp and the 989